It's now my great pleasure to introduce Paddy Pan Martin. He is the CEO of Aquapower, and uh, Aquapower is probably best known for delivering among the cheapest, most cost-effective uh, large-scale solar plants around the world, beating one record after the other. Um, uh, uh, Aqua does also desal project, has just announced uh, yet another project in that space uh, as well. But particularly relevant for this session, um, uh, Aqua has a couple of weeks back made an announcement of a 5 billion green ammonia project in Saudi Arabia. And we obviously want to learn much more about uh, um, this specific project and the green ammonia and hydrogen context there. With that, um, uh, please uh, uh, welcome Paddy Pan Manhattan. Uh, Paddy, um, please tell us more about this um, NEON project, um, uh, uh, some of the takeoff markets that you see um, for, for your green ammonia, and then we'll follow up with further questions. Paddy, please. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I am privileged to lead a company that has um, been very much in the forefront of uh, driving the cost of renewable energy down. And in fact, that is the entry point or the impetus for this um, green ammonia project. So I, I think uh, all of you know very well that uh, um, hydrogen is not uh, something new. Um, there is a lot of hydrogen that is already produced and used, um, particularly in fertilizer production, but also in oil refining and all sorts of other uses. Um, but all of that has been to date uh, produced using the steam reforming process by burning fossil fuels. Uh, but we have always known from our sort of uh, uh, physics, uh, chemistry lesson, sorry, in uh, school, that by sticking two electrodes into a pot of water, uh, we can produce, we can break the hydrogen and oxygen bond of water and produce hydrogen. But the issue there is the amount of electricity that is needed to do that. So it's a very electricity intensive process. And as long as electricity was very expensive, and in fact, fossil fuel produced electricity it turns out now compared to the renewables that we are able to deliver at is very expensive. This didn't make sense. <clears throat> now that we are able to start delivering uh, in certain parts of the world, where the resource is available, where land is abundant, credit worthiness is very well established, solar and wind at prices less than two, one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. These are numbers that you should be comparing with five and six uh, as a kind of norm, right? Um, all of a sudden, this electricity intensive process starts to become attractive. So the NEOM project is, well, there are many that has been announced. So this is one of the many first big scale plants. It's not about being the first. Let's wait and see. But we are working very feverishly away at making sure that we go into construction early next year. And I think we are very confident we can. So it's a $5 billion project that uses the fantastic renewable resources that are available in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, both wind and solar. So sun beating through the day. Uh, for about nine hours, and then wind also blowing very strongly at night. So we are able to couple both with a bit of battery to buffer it. Uh, that then allows us, uh, using the electrolysis process, to produce green hydrogen. Because green hydrogen is, for the moment anyway, not that easy to kind of transport over very long distances across the oceans, we are going to convert it to ammonia. So basically, ammonia is the energy carrier liquid ammonia, put it into ships, and ship it initially towards the Far East. So the project will produce 650 tons per day of hydrogen. Just to give context to that, we'll be utilizing 4,000 megawatts of uh, renewable energy to do that. And um, if we were to use all the hydrogen to power vehicles, which is probably where it'll go in the initial stage simply because that is the established industry today that's what is attracting attention and and the need uh, this amount of ammonia will provide for 700,000 vehicles so if we kind of continue to power that and produce that that will take out 3 million tons of carbon dioxide per year so it's a kind of one significant project but what is to me more exciting is that it then enables a pathway it shows that all of a sudden this is real this is viable this is uh, obviously uh, doable from a you know from a 
financially self-sustaining point of view because it's an entire it's not a charity project it's an entirely privately funded project three partners air products very capable they're the leading hydrogen producer of the world today using the steam uh, reforming process and um, neom um, a visionary future uh, it's not a city a region in the north end of saudi arabia so these so we've come into a one-third one-third partnership aqua power uh, neom and uh, air products to do this and uh, this will be a pathway and i think the easy one that everybody now starts to recognize is the hydrogen vehicles hydrogen fuel vehicles because they're already there uh, starting to be operated and so on and so forth but to me what is really also more exciting is that there is a segment a significant amount of carbon is emitted by a bunch of industrial users that we really don't have any other solutions for right now except hydrogen steel making fertilizer making uh, so even in agriculture, food, uh, there's a, aluminum, cement, there's a whole range of um, industrial processes where hydrogen can become the heat provider or the reducing agent um, directly now substituting uh, fossil fuels, coke, uh, coal. Uh, and that, I think, is much more exciting. And it's all then to do with cost competitiveness. Paddy, you, you say it's the key, some of the key figures, four gigawatts uh, of renewable power, um, 650 tons of hydrogen per, uh, per day. Um, you have that transformed into green ammonia because it's easier to transport. You use the largest chemical um, uh, supply chain. Ammonia is uh, the largest uh, traded chemical. So you don't need to invest in any infrastructure. So building your infrastructure close to existing um, uh, uh, hubs for um, uh, uh, for ammonia is obviously part of, of, of the trick here. Um, you deliver it uh, with potentially first utilization in the transport space, but you, you clearly say there's obviously multiple other uses where, um, and, and you refer to prices, we come back to the price question, but before that, you know, in terms of entry barriers, where do you see the demand um, that directly is interested in green ammonia to you? You mentioned transport, uh, but there's obviously others as well. Um, and that has low entry barriers in terms of existing infrastructure. Where would you expect um, your first clients um, to be in which segments? So, so uh, Christoph, the, the, the lowest entry barrier is, of course, uh, transportation. Um, because Not only because... Um, the, the vehicles are there, the buses are starting to be produced and so on and so forth. So there is a uh, supply there on that, on that side of it and the demand is there. Um, and there is uh, the, the carbon pricing in an inverted way through subsidized, uh, some subsidy mechanisms is being provided in, uh, you know, whether it's in California, whether it's in Korea, whether it's in Japan, uh, different places. Okay, so that obviously is the easiest entry point. For me, very close behind it has got to be steel. Um, because, okay, so we do now need to talk about costs. So, look, our view, rightly or wrongly, if we're able to produce electricity at less than two cents, and as you start to produce uh, hydrolysis at scale for these very large plants, the, okay, the electrolysis, sorry, and these are things that have been made in small modules before, but if as we start to produce more uh, at scale, we are very confident that we, the price of hydrogen can come down to definitely below two and a half dollars a kilo. Comparator, one dollar a kilo is the kind of price at which we can produce hydrogen using the steam um, reforming process using fossil fuels. Now, there is no carbon pricing and I'm, I'm not gonna waste my time waiting for carbon pricing. So we've got to come down to, to one dollar in my view, that is possible. I think it is possible faster than 2030. But for steel, I think we can put in at two dollars and still compete against coke. It is a different uh, process uh, for raw steel, converting pig iron to steel. But to the extent that new capacity, some of the older plants have to be mothballed, they're inefficient and so on. New capacity need to be built. They will be built using this uh, new processes and you can inject hydrogen straight away and start to produce 
steel at about 500, 450 to $500 a ton, which then starts to be competitive with uh, doing it the polluting way. So cost, you're saying 1.5 cents, that's what you have done in other places already, 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour, if one assumes about the 2,000 hour operations, purely renewable um, uh, for, for, for the electrolyzer, um, then then you're saying, you know, that, that, that we, we get in the order of money of 2 to 3, 2.5 uh, dollars per kilogram of hydrogen and obviously that would allow um, for steel almost, um, if, you get, if you get even to the one, we would have competitive um, uh, a situation for steel production, but it's also in the order of magnitude. Obviously, that is interesting for transport. That would a two to three dollar per kilogram of hydrogen would uh, correspond to fifty to eighty cents equivalent gasoline, and you see that market obviously responding ra ra right away. And and then um, uh, steel. What other uses do you have in mind? Uh, Pat? Oh, um, uh, the, the, the next obvious immediate use is ammonia itself for fertilizer production. Enormous one. So definitely, we should be targeting converting the 80 million tons of um, uh, hydrogen that we produce today using steam reforming process, which pretty much goes for uh, exclusively almost for uh, oil refining uh, as well as for uh, fertilizer production. That, that can get dealt with uh, fairly quickly uh, thereafter. Look, uh, the strategy as we see it, the transport will give us enormous amount of volume, okay? so. I mean, if you look at the market that is immediately available, they can absorb 10 NEOM projects. Now, use the transport market in order, and, and the minute you start doing three, four, five of the NEOM size projects, you're going to be driving the electrolyzer cost down. So, what is the cost at a high level? Something like 70% of the cost of producing green hydrogen is electricity. The rest of the cost is the capex of and the opex of the of, of the of the of the plant itself the electrolyzer and all the other uh, governments that go around it. Now, this you need to start, and also obviously the financing cost for all this capex. So long as we remain in this very low interest rate environment, which I think we can confidently uh, say we're going to be for the next decade, keep focusing on bringing the cost of electrolyzer down. So within about five or six NEOM projects, we will start now competing shoulder to shoulder uh, with um, with the other way of producing hydrogen. So going to uh, uh, aluminum, cement, um, fertilizer, um, and uh, also then start to look at, there's a whole lot of smaller uses like food, uh, chemicals, um, the, the exotic, the, and soon thereafter, of course, synthetic fuel. Uh, you you mentioned basically all the hard to abate, um, and there's one exception, one that you haven't mentioned. You haven't mentioned, and and but could also add shipping, obviously. But the one you haven't mentioned is coal. Uh, you we know that there's about 700 uh, coal plants under construction. They will be they will be around for the next is it 40 to 60 years somewhere. And if we do not obviously uh, provide solutions uh, in, in that space, then then we the uh, you know the the decarb agenda will suffer from that. And we know that Japan has done pilots or is in doing pilots in the coal uh, substituting ammonia to coal do you see demand in that se segment as well for your so, ammonia? yes 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 so no that, that is an important one you're absolutely thank you for bringing that back because that that is a huge segment right yes i think so there is an opportunity there for coal firing and for uh, starting to uh, bring down the coal consumption even in a coal power, uh, fired power plant and reduce the emissions yes not as um, uh, beneficial um, as sort of, you know, getting rid of the coal plant altogether. But the reality is we are stuck with coal plants uh, for the next uh, 25, 30 years. Yeah, you're right. So, so there is an opportunity there. And when it comes to the regional fit, you have mentioned particularly that the interest is coming from far east at this stage. There has been a lot of discussion in Europe, in France, Germany yes. in particular, but uh, around hydrogen. But uh, it, it seems to me from what we have heard so far, most of the discussion has gone into what can be produced actually in, in Europe. How, how do you view the local production versus international trade um, uh, as part of the uh, future pathway into, into hydrogen? Interesting question right now to be dis discussing simply in this era of, um, uh, you know, uh, all the geopolitical tensions and all the rest of it, right? But, but, and 
the reaction post COVID or, or through the COVID sort of becoming much more local, focusing on what you can do yourself and so on and so forth. But the reality is, this is energy is such a basic input to everything that we do. Ultimately, we will go back to where is it that we can most efficiently produce it, take it into our economies, utilize that for the multiply effect. Don't get so tangled up in, I've got to produce the energy also at home. Now, okay, now having said that, so Europe, I'm very convinced we're pioneering the way through the use of hydrogen, I have no doubt about it. But look at the problem, the, the, ch the challenge for Europe is going to be, so if I can produce electricity at one and a half cents, or less, in fact, in Morocco. And in Europe, yes, you have fantastic offshore wind. But sorry, it's still going to be much more than that. It's never going to come down. Never. OK, I'm the last person to say that. But, uh, you know, to one and a half cents per kilo uh, per kilowatt hour. So if I can do that in Morocco, um, come on. The logic is let's produce a masses of hydrogen, pipe it across into the European network. That, that, that's the way it's going to go. Thank you very much, Paddy Panamanathan. I think we are at the end of this interview, unfortunately, timing-wise, but I think you have left us with a few very strong messages you have said and um, built stuff where um, uh, there is abundant sun, where you can cheap, uh, cheaply produce um, renewable energy, be that from sun or from wind. Make sure you are close to supply chain, and make sure that you your customer base is where the hard to abates are, and you have covered. Uh, you you are looking at all the hard to abates, and and in the end, I think you are saying in the end there must be a globally traded. Um, uh, commodity here because simply the cost, the production cost will hugely differ and Europe may not be the cheapest. Thank you very much, Paddy. This was an excellent uh, contribution here to our European Venture Fair. My pleasure. I'm so delighted to have joined you. Thank you for the opportunity.